Welcome to the sacristy of the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. Andrew and I were going through some stuff uh, here in the sacristy. We discovered that <laughs> um, it's not common knowledge the different Eucharistic prayers that the church has in the Missal. So at Mass, you might hear differences in those Eucharistic prayers. And I just want to spin through real quick some of the main things that distinguish them and some of the, I don't know, highlights from, from each one. So um, in the Missal, there's going to be four main Eucharistic prayers right in front of the priest. So when he's finishing, finishing the preface and you're singing the Holy, Holy, Holy or the Sanctus, he's going to be turning to the Eucharistic prayer next, right? And he's got four options typically um, that he could choose from. I'll give some, some nuances to that answer in a bit. But just to go through these, the first one that's given is called Eucharistic Prayer 1. This is also called the Roman Canon. It's called the Roman Canon because this was the Eucharistic prayer that the, the Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church used for uh, like probably a thousand years, definitely since Trent. Um, so in the 1500s, ever since then, it was like the standard Eucharistic prayer all the way up to Vatican II, right? And much of this prayer um, came from the time of like Gregory the Great. So this is a very old and ancient prayer. It's also the longest one. So this is the one where the priest is going to, it, this is the, uh, the one where the priest is going to mention those names of the saints. These are like the favorite saints of the Roman church. If you go down this list, they're not all from Rome. They're from all over the, the ancient church, right? But these are the ones that the people in Rome during the 300s or the 400s and the 500s were like, these are our favorite saints, right? And so they're listed in the canon. Now, a lot of them are early popes, are, early, are the apostles, early martyrs. Um, but get to know those stories because these were like, I don't know, um, the cast of characters that the early church was like, I want to be like that, right? Um, this... This Eucharistic prayer also has particular inserts for specific feast days and solemnities. So you'll see on the Nativity of the Lord, so that's the whole octave of Christmas for the Epiphany, for Easter Vigil, and that octave for the Ascension, for Pentecost. Um, for that reason, um, and just because of the kind of ancientness of this particular prayer, the church will often use this one on big feast days. If one of those, if we're celebrating one of the apostles, or if we're doing, you know, if we're on the Epiphany or on Christmas, usually a priest is going to choose um, this particular prayer. All right. Um, you'll notice that at, after communion as well, or after the consecration as well, rather, there's another kind of litany of, of those favorite saints. This is where you get all those early, uh, beautiful stories of those early martyrs, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, right? All those, all those different saints. All right. That's Eucharistic prayer one. Eucharistic prayer two is the shortest Eucharistic prayer. This is the one, if you have ever noticed, fathers say those words, sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall. Um, that's, um, that's the phrase that's going to give this one away. Just an interesting note about that. It's kind of an odd symbolism, right? But think about the dewfall. You, don't, you never see the dew accumulate on the grass, right? But, there, but there's something almost, I'll say almost magical or mystical about that, right? And in the same way, the priest, when he's doing the epiclesis, right, he's calling down the Holy Spirit, but this one references that as the dewfall in the sense of like um, just coming upon us in a way that we cannot uh, anticipate, expect, or uh, kind of even see, right? Um, and that's what the Holy Spirit is doing um, at the Mass uh, when God is, is through the priest consecrating the, the bread and the wine. Okay. As I said, that's the shortest one. The Eucharistic Prayer 2 was developed after the Second Vatican Council, and it, it takes some of its roots to very, very early prayers that we know the Church said way back at the beginning. So if you look at the Didache or some of these other very close to the apostolic times texts of the Church, um, some of the phrases and some of the ways that the wording is used in Eucharistic Prayer 2 are kind of taking their, their roots from, uh, from that time period. All right, that gets us to Eucharistic Prayer 3. This one is probably the most popular I don't know. It's it's nice because it's a little bit longer than Eucharistic Prayer 2. So you're not, I don't know, as a priest, I don't feel like I'm rushing into the consecration. I've got just a little bit more time to sort of absorb what it is that's about to happen um, at the Mass when the, the bread and wine are consecrated into Jesus' body and blood. The other neat thing about this Eucharistic Prayer um, is that during the time when you're calling upon um, the Most Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and Glorious Martyrs, here in Eucharistic Prayer 3, you can include the saint of the day or a patron saint of the church. Um, and the other Eucharistic prayers don't have that kind of opening to sort of put in whatever saint that the, the priest might think important that day. So if there's a feast day, that's not like a super high solemnity or, or something. Often I'm going to use Eucharistic Prayer 3 because it allows me to invoke that saint right after the consecration to sort of invite them. We know the saints and angels are there, but to really invite them, uh, so to speak, to like be present to us right then and be like an intercessor for us right then. Okay, last big one, 
is Eucharistic Prayer 4. This one is not used quite as much. This one has its own preface that you have to use, which, not to get too complicated here, but that means that you can't use this particular Eucharistic prayer if there's another preface that you have to use. So like during Advent or Lent, you have to use the preface of Advent or Lent. So you couldn't use this Eucharistic prayer because it's got its own built-in preface. But the reason that it has that preface built in is because this Eucharistic prayer is kind of a, a beautiful sort of poetic um, retelling of the, the stories of the covenants that God has, has made with man, right? It's using some um, inspiration from Eastern, right, churches um, that, that didn't, you know, that hadn't developed in the, the Roman canon, let's say, right? Um, but after Vatican II, again, they're like, hey, let's take some of the, the jewels and the wisdom and the, the experience of these Eastern churches and bring it into this particular prayer. And they go through, it's beautiful. Um, it talks about the, the fall of man, right? You form man in your own image, entrusted the whole world to his care. Um, but then through disobedience, we lost God's friendship, right? Um, we, we closed ourselves off. But then covenants and prophets and salvation is coming, right? That's, it uses these beautiful lines from St. John's Gospel. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. Or uh, bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the full. Um, I think maybe my favorite part is right before the consecration. We're always calling to mind the Last Supper, right? Um, but here, what does it say? For when the hour had come, for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, having loved his own hurry in the world, he loved them to the end. Um, and then it goes into the, the retelling and the, and the actual words, the institution of the, the, the Eucharist. Um, but it's that beautiful line from St. John's Gospel, right? He loved them to the end, all the way through the Passion. Jesus is, is pouring love out for us, right? And every time we come to these Eucharistic prayers, the same thing is happening, right? We step back into that upper room, right? With the apostles and with the saints and with all the, the martyrs and everybody else. Um, and we join them um, as Jesus as Jesus gives us his body and blood. So maybe another question, right? When would you use the different ones? Just to sum it up, I think for Eucharistic Prayer 1, you're going to usually use that on Sundays or other solemnities when, especially if you're hearkening to any of those saints that are mentioned in that Eucharistic Prayer. Eucharistic Prayer 2, the church kind of um, recommends that Eucharistic Prayer 2 would not be used on Sundays because it's so short, but maybe on other daily masses or weekday masses where you don't have a, a particular feast to celebrate but want to kind of focus in on, on the consecration right away, right? Eucharistic Prayer 3, I guess it fits best, again, during those daily masses, could be used on a Sunday mass, um, but if, in particular, if you want to invoke a, a special saint um, that day. And then Eucharistic Prayer 4 is is only going to be used during ordinary time, um, but could be used on Sundays or, or daily masses Anytime we want to sort of go back to the Old Testament and remind ourselves of the way that, that God has been working all the way through. Um, you can see there's treasures in each one of these, right? So the priest sort of has to choose, uh, but whichever one he ends up using, right? There's, there's something beautiful and uh, obviously the Lord is, is present um, in each one in, in kind of different ways, right? With different focuses. Um, but the church gives us options so that we can come to know the mystery of the Eucharist even better.